It's a great pleasure to be here to introduce my um, dear friend and colleague and mentor, Gayatri Spivak. But it's also a great honor to be here to recognize what year after year, uh, decade after decade, Henry Louis Gates manages to achieve, sometimes when the wind is with him, sometimes against the odds, but he never fails, he never gives up, and today's event is yet another accolade for Skip. So I would like us to applaud the Institute and the director of the Institute and the man who, unknown to you, was responsible for President Obama's Peace Prize <laughs> around the Beer Summit. Without the Beer Summit, there would have been no Peace Prize. Skip Gates. <laughs> so we have fun here. <clears throat> Thank you, Skip. For those of you, this is off, by the way, just to find for me. Not find for Gaitri. For those of you who need an introduction to Gayatri Spivak, university professor at Columbia, I have only one thing to say. Go back to school. <laughs> and this time, choose your courses with greater care. <laughs> or come and talk to me in my office hours. <laughs> Gayatri Spivak is a pioneer in many fields of literary, linguistic, and legal studies. <clears throat> She's a scholar in areas as diverse as classical Sanskrit, English or British Romanticism, German idealism, the Marxist tradition, women's history in an international frame, deconstruction, psychoanalysis for and against, and South Asian subaltern studies. What gives her presence here as the W.E.B. Du Bois distinguished lecturer a particular resonance is her dedicated service to ideals and missions that have distinguished her as a scholar activist. Many of you may be stunned by the force and complexity of one of her most memorable and provocative essays, Can the Subaltern Speak? Graduate students, it is said, across the United States have wagered half their annual grants on whether the subaltern can or cannot speak. I will provide an answer sometime later this academic year. But the lessons of that brave and beautiful essay have guided Gayatri's hand. She has not only given Jacques Derrida the gift of his English tongue in her monumental translation of Of Grammatology, but she has also been translator and comrade to Mahashweta Devi, one of India's leading activist writers. She has never spoken for the histories or experiences of others. She has always spoken alongside those thinkers or activists with whom she has made common cause. For over 20 years, Gayatri has been for me a mentor, a friend, and a guide. My first visit to the US was in response to an invitation from Gayatri. So between Gayatri inviting me to the States, Skip and Gayatri making it possible for me to come to Harvard, I never did anything for myself. <laughs> and that's the way to succeed. Be like me. Have good friends. Her writings are legion, her intelligence and intellectual curiosity uncontainable. But as she once said to me in a quiet moment, without a touch of immodesty, I think I have courage. And I fully agree then with you as I do now, Gayatri. Gayatri has set the benchmark of courage for all of us who have striven to work across disciplines, in the midst of the diversity of literatures and languages, at the crossroads of the academy and the everyday political world, 
within the uneven and unequal circumstances of the global imperial conjunction. Gayatri's courage has manifested itself in her ability to read against the grain of literary narrative and authoritarian or authoritative cultural histories. Recall her own unique coupling of Jane Eyre and White Sagas O.C. or Defoe and Kutsia to create textual and historical crossroads that lead towards unexpected conditions and contingent conclusions. Gayatri's courageous imagination is invested in the rhetorical mode of catechesis. A concept, now I quote here, and I'll tell you why, and I quote, um, a concept metaphor without an adequate referent reversing, displacing, and seizing the apparatus of value coding, perverting its embedded context. This quote is actually a hybrid amalgam done by David Richards, a wonderful writer on, uh, in England on African, contemporary African literature and theory. And David, I was reading David Richards' book, and this is a quote about catechesis, which is half from Gayatri and half from me. So he put them two together, and I thought that given catechesis was such an important conceptual trope, as well as a form of practical uh, literary interpretation, that I would read this particular double-backed uh, interpretation. Somewhere between the practice of deconstruction and the project of rural education and reconstruction, Gayatri Spivak has found her path as scholar-activist. In 1986, she began a career of activist commitments that took her into rural primary health care and educational work in Bangladesh and involvement with many feminist global inst movements. Also in 1986, she established her own rural elementary school in two of the most backward districts of West Bengal, India. For the last 10 years, she has organized a movement for ecological agriculture in the area of her schools in response to, in, in response to the demands of local peasants. It is such commitments and actions that make Spivak's encounter with W.E.B. Du Bois so apposite and so exciting. Du Bois is simply one of the very greatest of all Americans one of the modern world's most luminous citizens. For me, Du Bois is the great founding father of this American world for a reason more profound and intense than any other. For me, he far exceeds the construction of the Constitution and those founding fathers whose histories and whose names are repeated again and again and again, great as they are. Many have argued for the preeminence of America on the grounds of its manifest destiny, its worldly power and sway, and its remarkable democratic experiment. For Du Bois, however, until and unless every American delves deep into his or her divided soul, his or her double consciousness, Americans can never emerge as one people or one nation. That oneness is made out of the experience of the division, whether the division is the color line, the class line, the gender line. It is by going through the veil, as Du Bois says again and again, that we can emerge into a culture of solidarity, empathy, and some form of workable unity. To speak in the W.E.B. Du Bois series carries with it then the burden and the gift of this difficult and daring dream of American freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Uh, you always give me these fulsome introductions, which I hardly deserve. But today, you have said one correct thing. I do not really have any, any lack of courage to give uh, the Du Bois lectures in this company. It's a proof of my courage, which I hope, Abiola I, I really walked in, I went up, I shook his hand, not to say hello, I to say, please listen to this with indulgence. It's the beginning of a work, okay? It's not something, and especially in this kind of a room, it, this sort of challenge allows, hey, homie, goodbye, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> You'll say more, boy. Long time to learn, but finally I get it. You'll say more. Okay, bye. Bye. Anyway, you get, you get the picture. So I'm going to try to do something, attempt something, which uh, it scares me. But um, I'm not going to stop because it does seem to me that this is work. As you hear, you'll see how I'm speculating. And you'll see that it is something that I need to. There's so much work if you start working on Du Bois that, you know, it's going to take much longer. I hope, in fact, Lindsay, between now and publishing, I will have the time to do some of the work that's needed. But all I ask is that you appreciate that this is the beginning of a journey and that I want to continue. I'm not going to be discouraged, even if you say, you know, that's, that's the courage. And Skip, the cabbie, wanted me to find out what you thought about the beer summit. <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't going to bring it up, but since Homie already <laughs> brought it up, I thought I would say something, because there, there was an accident on the West Side Highway, so I missed my, uh, my train, see? I, that's why I'm sort of getting in in this kind of 1960s style, because uh, I just came from the station. So we had a lot of time together, you know? And so he says, so what are you going to do? I said, well, you heard of the boys of like, I said, of course. But, you know, I got, into, I got into a discussion with him because he is, I was saying that I was going to talk about the way Dr. King recoded Gandhi, which is not exactly how we think. And I'm going to take that kind of, I'm going to take courage from there to read Du Bois in this way, etc. And then we got into a discussion. He's more from, Mal from Malcolm, see? Oh. So I actually got into a kind of pre-discussion of that, and I saw Malcolm X when I was at Cornell, right, 1960? Uh, yes, absolutely, James Brown and Malcolm X, he came to dinner at uh, Telluride, uh, and I, we were sitting there and shaking at the dinner table, I mean, never uttered a word, but yes, absolutely, it's good. one of the great, great moments in my life. So at any rate, so I've already had a discussion of this, so the talk for me has already begun, and in a certain kind of context, which is more important, if you will forgive my saying so, this is my 46th year of full-time teaching, so I do, I have the right to say this, in a context that seemed to me to be a little more uh, important and challenging for me than this wonderful, uh, wonderful invitation, which is challenging uh, altogether. Anyway, I get into my uh, talk now. Um, I want to begin with C.L.R. James, Two quotes, okay? The uh, first one is simply the beginning of um, reflections on Pan-Africanism. You can hear me, right? Perfect. Okay. Um, uh, he says, C.L.R. James, part one, he opens, a very distinguished writer, George Lemming, a West Indian, makes it a rule to despise what is called, quote, suspense. He says he has no use for it in his writing, and I think that in regard to what I have to say, says C.L.R. James, in these two evenings, of course in my case three afternoons, I should get that subject clear and keep you out of any suspense you might have, and so on. And so that's just exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I want uh, to quote again C.L.R. James because it's going to introduce what I'm going to do. I'll give, a, I'll give an outline. And then I'll begin reading where I thank you fulsomely, the written text, and you will hear my, my friend Henry Lewis Gates Jr. and so on, okay? But for the moment, this is what C.L.R. James um, uh, wants us to do. I want now uh, to look at some unpublished notes where C.L.R. James writes about the Black Reconstruction, saying, 
Similar studies, a footnote by him, similar studies are imperatively demanded of this protein figure after history should come sociology. And what similar studies? Though Dr. Du Bois writes, CLR James, is writing about black slaves, the historical conclusion is the role of the uneducated mass of the population, black or white, in a great historical event. And he goes on, goes on to say, it is impossible to exaggerate the tremendous historical step taken there. The only thing comparable I can think of is a section in the world famous book of the greatest of all French historians, Michelet's History of the French Revolution. Now, what was it that C.L.R. James was talking about? The uneducated, remember, that's the point uh, du Bois makes in Black Reconstruction when he's talking about the general strike, right? That these folks illiterate without any, and so the debate has arisen, like was he right or was he wrong? But what this uneducated business, the, uh, the, the, the point, the question is always asked, did he use the word proletariat correctly for these, these black folks? And some say yes, and they bring out tarara, and some say no, and they bring out tarara. That is a descriptive term. That's not what is at issue here. Whereas general strike is a term that describes an action. Proletariat is a descriptive term, and most of us outside of the European story don't fit it. But general strike, Du Bois is redefining it, and CLR James has put his finger on it when he says more studies like this ought to be undertaken. What is Du Bois writing about? Du Bois, excuse the word, he, this is never used in the context of the study of African America. Du Bois, the uneducated, illiterate, unorganized folks doing a general strike, Du Bois is speaking absolutely about the African American subaltern. The subaltern, says Gramsci, is those who do not achieve the state. Very nice description. When, when uh, Du Bois talks about the Freedmen's uh, uh, Bureau and uh, the breakdown, etc., he's beginning to talk about how is it the, that the, the, these uh, African Americans are achieving the state. I always ask myself why people leave at a certain point, but I haven't said anything yet. Perhaps it wasn't a good thing to have said subaltern. But at any rate, <laughs> as, I, as I said, be indulgent, okay? Be indulgent. The, at any rate, the, so the, the point is that when he's talking about the Freedmen's Bureau and why it disappeared, what is he talking about? He's talking about the fact that as the subaltern was in fact achieving a, a, a state and going outside of subalternity into citizenship, it didn't work. Now there's a debate there too. Was it racism or was it capitalism? Excuse me for saying this, and I'm a humanities teacher, perhaps I shouldn't uh, step in where the historians fear to tread, but that really is not a serious question. Is that an either or? Was it racism or was it capitalism? I don't believe so. I had a, David Levering Lewis has been very indulgent towards me, he's a nice guy, and so I said, when I said to him, what I was, you haven't heard the worst yet, what I was going to do today, I said to him finally, look at here, don't laugh. You historians laugh at this kind of stuff that we do. But, I said, not Aristotle. And he laughed, you know, he gave a wonderful, you know how he laughs, I mean, you know, open and funny. So, to an extent, that's what I would say. Those debates as to, did it quite qualify? Of course it didn't. The proletarian sells his labor, doesn't even sell, but advances uh, labor, and the capitalist pays back less and that's how surplus value rises. I mean, yeah, sure, and no, nobody was selling anything here. So to an extent, what Du Bois is doing is extremely bold, taking, and that's what CLR James is looking at, taking the normative description of the general strike, which is not the St. Louis uh, general strike in the 19th century, but the 1904-5 general strike in the Russian Empire, taking that kind of, and even if it were the 1878, he's, 1861 to, to 80, that's even further, right, back. 
He's taking the, he's taking the definition of the general strike, re-territorializing it, taking it outside of capital logic into an area which is still within capital logic. And in this, I'm going to try to bring him in with someone called Antonio Gramsci who had exactly that kind of problem. In Du Bois' handwritten notes, he says, when he says that he, this is an extremely important thing, the <clears throat> In 1848, when the Communist Manifesto was written, the world's laboring class was weak physically in front of the owners. Today, the workers are the backbone of the owner's power, their army and navy, because of the English general strike. Now, this, this is his working notes, uh, and there's much more coming. But what is the project that he, uh, that he writes down there as he's thinking about the general strike? That the first thing that needs to be done, the first difficult conversion is to break the racism of the proletariat. Now, this is exactly word for word. I don't know if there's anybody in this room. I see some of my former students who took the Gramsci course, but this is exactly the, uh, the problem that Gramsci encounters, the extraordinary prejudice against the subaltern. So to bring this together. So I would like to, uh, Ronald Judy has written an excellent article, but that article is about what Gramsci thought about um, the American Negro. That's not my project, right? So at any rate, the, that's, I wanted to follow C.L.R. James's and George Lemming's, um, George Lemming's um, suggestion and uh, give you a little, uh, a little uh, summary of what I was going to do. Now, in order for this, um, and there's a lot of literature, as you know, about was he correct, etc. And Levering Lewis himself, of course, just dismisses it as one of those many, many things that Du Bois became impassioned about and so on. But what I'm trying to say here is that right or wrong is an academic point here. What we have to look for, and I speak myself as someone who was given Marx to read by her uncle at the age of 15. I didn't learn Marxism in college. And our left in West Bengal has gone to hell now. So to an extent, I'm, from, I'm speaking from within a certain kind of experience. I would say that what we really have to understand here, since Marx himself, in fact, was not a serious activist, he wrote. He was a brilliant counterintuitive man, as was Du Bois. Du Bois was also a counterintuitive thinker. He cannot be really uh, caught by us into the kinds of things that we think. And it seems to me what we really have to ask is, what was the dream behind the general strike? What was the, now I'm gonna read all of this again because I'm just summarizing, okay? But it'll bear repeating, and I'll stop exactly when I need to stop. What was the, <laughs> What was the dream behind the general strike? That's the real question, not does it fit the definition because it will always be the Euro-US. I mean, look at ben, uh, Benedict Anderson's extremely popular book. Asia just didn't know what to do with Marxism. That's his point, right? So it is always, even for Levering Lewis, it's always the European definitions that will win. We will never fit those. What was the dream? And in my talk, I will say, so as not to keep you in suspense, the dream of the general strike was as follows. People like Sorel, Rosa uh, Luxembourg, Gramsci, and so on, and many, many others, they felt that and, uh, the IWW was a little bit different, okay? So, but we're not going there right now. The, that's the last day. But at any rate, they felt that in the general strike, it's actually the worker who is the agent because it's against the employer. The ideologues are not employed by the, by, so you know most of us in this room are morally outraged ideal, ideologues, right? So we desperately want somehow to have the working class be the agent. And if we can somehow say, hey, you know, uh, I, my origins are working class, if we can say that we are even nicer. The fact that we have gotten entry into this room doesn't matter. But at any rate, so therefore, they felt that in the, it was in the general strike 
that it was the worker who was the agent. Rosa Luxemburg went so far as to say that the intellectuals can give no more than tactical advice, because what do they know? They are not, on, they are not employed by the Washington College. This was a little romantic, but we'll come to that later. That's not part of my summary. But then the point that Du Bois and Gramsci for sure and many, and even Sorel in his own way, although not very deeply, the, the, what they felt was, how do we bring together the justified self-interest of the agent of the general strike, who is the worker, that's freedom from, right? Freedom from exploitation. And the moral outrage of folks who can feel about saving the world from exploitation. This is almost straight from Marx, right? So how do we go from freedom from to freedom to? Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, the idea, I mean, even Paulo Freire, when he suggests that without the pedagogy of the oppressed, the, uh, the uh, oppressed become sub-oppressors. Mm -hmm. This common sense fact is where the dream of the general strike is located. So that to an extent, the dictatorship of the proletariat never could last. Dictate because it was a dictatorship, not because it was of the proletariat. And that's something that, one, you know, that's another discussion and I'm very, I'm somewhat more qualified to have that discussion than I am to talk about Du Bois. But nonetheless, the, it's not, the, that's not the issue. Was it he, Du Bois certainly used that phrase. So did Gramsci, so did everyone. It was a wonderful dream also. But it doesn't have the, the substance of the dream of the general strike where the question is about the world being saved by the worker agent. How can such a thing be accomplished? It's easy to say that. You know, Sorel simply said that. You will find that they know everything. But anyone who has worked for any length of time with, in fact, people who are at the bottom know very well that those are empty words. And that's what the general strike is about. How to make this epistemological shift so that those who act in justified self-interest can become folks who are morally open to others. Du Bois also says this over and over again. That's the dream. Right? And at the heart of that dream is a different kind of education. That, so that's why I want to uh, talk about this. This is not about anything more substantive than why the general strike. The question is not whether he was factually and definitionally correct. Of course, that's, if you define it from, I mean, it's obvious. If you define it from the great general strike of Moscow, no. But even Gramsci thought that Rosa, as she says, was, came too soon. So it is what later has been called, and I am a sufferer here as well, what happens after independence? If you have not learned the practice of freedom, why do post-colonial states go to hell? To an extent, that is also the question that is implicit in the dream of the general strike. It is not identical with the dream of the general strike, but that is the summary of my talk. So I'm going now, and in Du Bois, the substance of the dream is mired in the kinds of things that we feminists sometimes find a little questionable, you know, that word character. Hmm? So if you look, but on the other hand, on the last day, I'm going to talk some about why it is that in, the, in that idea of character, why it is that the figure of the mother and reproductive heteronormativity and all of that, why is it so deeply involved? Casting a stone would be a huge mistake there. So to an extent, that's more or less the summary of what I'm going to do. Let me also say that therefore I take the dream as my allegory of reading. Yeah? What does that mean? I'm going to repeat all of this in the talk, okay? Mm -hmm. What does the, I'm just kind of, you know. What does that mean? What it means is that in an allegory of reading, you see, most people, like they would say, was it the proletarian or was it the subaltern? It's like a contrast. One of us has to be right. 
But those of us who have, and Homi was kind enough, actually it wasn't just Homi, Michaela wanted me to write a very long biography, so I never put in anything about the, that, uh, uh, you know, my schools, et cetera, et cetera. But I thought, how can I make it long? So I had to put that in, okay? But he did mention, he did mention that I do this kind of, I've been since 1986, really working like a dog uh, in the grassroots, very uncomfortable, but very wonderful. But in fact, the, that kind of thing does teach you that this allegory of reading, the idea that two opposite things actually produce something rather than cancel out. This is a very practical kind of, this is a very practical kind of, kind of uh, uh, situation that contradictory instructions come to you. Uh, every activist, every teacher, every parent knows this. That contradictory instructions come to you at the same time. And you have to learn to play with it. Eh? And that's the allegory of reading, an allegorical view. So the dream and reason together don't cancel each other out. And this is why I said to Levering Lewis what I said, the, that you know, Aristotle didn't laugh, and so then he gave me a laugh. But at any, at any rate, so that's what the dream therefore, I mean, and when I say dream, I don't mean kind of some kind of metaphorical stuff, like you know, our dream of the future and so on, no. I mean something absolutely literal. I hope for all your sakes that you dream at night. I don't mean metaphorical dream about wonderful future and having a billion dollars or winning the lottery. But the part that dreams at night is something that manages, that, that does damage control for our most wonderful and most fragile attribute, reason. So if we share, if we share reason with everyone, by which we mean just a simple set of evidentiary syllogisms, we also certainly, all human beings, share the fact that they have this damage control mechanism inbuilt that, that manages the crisis of the fact that reason is fragile and does not represent us fully. That doesn't mean to be unreasonable. You see, that's kind of a crazy thing that's always somebody puts up the hand from the way, ah, irrationalism. No, no, it, it is to be rational. In order that we can be rational, the crisis has to be managed. God knows, you know, I'm a lot older than Homi and Skip. I'm going to be 68 in three months. And as you're moving toward death and you keep on working, you feel that that damage control is necessary. Reason is not the same thing as it seems when you're young and starting. So it's as practical as that. I'm not using the word dream uh, symbolically or allegorically when I say it is my allegory of reading. Okay, now let's see where I can go from here. Okay, no, I want to also say something else in my summary and then I'll go where I have to go. In fact, in turn, it's trouble, trouble, Lindsay, I should just go get, to my, get to my talk, you think? Rather than all this fussing around. Okay, because you know, I have, I have three days. I want to say that this, this... You to talk too. I know, I'll stop, I'll tell you when I'll stop. Okay. I'll stop exactly at five o'clock. No. No? Well, 50 minutes, or oh, 4.20 I started, 10 past five. Okay. You take your time. No, that's it, uh, that's when I'll stop, because at three days it'll be So, the thing is, you want to talk to, if suppose I were here, Jacques Derrida, because I don't happen. deserve it, but nonetheless, you know, like, <laughs> man, could he talk? Hours. Yeah, but at any rate, so this debate, of course, started very early, as you know, as, I mean, most people here know, right? The uh, letter from Benjamin Stolberg, when Du Bois hesitantly asked exactly this question to Harrison Stolberg. Stolberg says, I feel that both your chapter headings, Lindsay, it sounds like you, the one on the dictatorship of the black proletariat and the one on the dictatorship of the white proletariat will get you into critical difficulties. <laughs> he writes this, right? And Harris, and then he writes more, you know, for one thing, there can be no such thing as a proletarian dictatorship without a meticulous ideological working out of the conception of the dictatorship and so on, okay. But uh, then Harris doesn't even give him a proper answer. Harris's letter is not about this question. Harris shoots him uh, with his review 
books in review, Harris writes, uh, 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 Dr. Du Bois is a racialist whose discovery of Marx as a, as a critical instrument has been too recent and sudden for it to discipline his mental processes <laughs> or basically to change his social philosophy. You know, we've made him into a god. This is his friend writing. This is <laughs> Abraham Harris was his friend, right? Yeah. And so he like goes on and on in this way. Again, it's worth, it's worth reading much more than whatever I might say, but I'm sure most of you have already read it. So, and according to Dr. Du Bois, the Civil War was won by general strike, writes Harris, of over 200,000 slave laborers. He tells us that these slaves, rather than avenge 250 years of unpaid labor through the use of physical force, merely quit the plantations while their masters were at the front and flocked en masse to the northern army. So he says, how can this be called general strikes? So when I am looking at these kinds of things, I am really taking on something which I don't really have the capacity to take on. But on the other hand, I've tried to lay out where I'm coming from. Where I'm coming from in this country where there is, in general, even if you are really kind of uh, left radicals, which of course in elite universities you find a good few, but these days even that is kind of gone because we are all post-Marxist, post-humanist, post-feminists. But at any rate, whatever, whatever you are, it seems to me that I am kind of speaking from a crumbling already existing left uh, situation, right? That's the one thing, crumbling. Uh, how it fails is known very well by us West Bengalis. So therefore, to an extent, I'm talking from a place which does give me a bit of something about the dream of the general strike. I don't know, I know, I see Obishek, but Obishek, uh, think about it, general strike, eh? where are you? Uh, think about it, huh? Bangla Bang. That's it. So uh, that's, that's the general strike. You know, we know what we are talking about and how it can go wrong. At any rate, so now begins my thanks to my friend, Henry Louis Gates Jr., for having invited me. I thank Del and Michaela for bearing with me through the entire period from invitation to microphone. I thank Brent Hayes Edwards for having insisted in 1991, when he was my student, that given my interests, I should focus on the souls of black folk. And you know, it was just beautiful when a student tells you, hey, got you, you know. And I thank Lindsay Van Tyne, my research assistant, with, who I think will be here the last day, without whose labors I would not be standing here today. Uh, Brandon, are you here? No, well, my implied reader is Brandon Obolu one generation from Nigeria, my wonderful uh, work study person. You remember that whole fracas over Abiola, uh, not Abiola, sorry, um, uh, Falabo, because I had uh, addressed her uh, as if she were a black European, right? Yeah, and to an extent, Du Bois has enabled me to understand, I mean, this whole business in the, in the essay in Alan Locke, mm -hmm. you know, about the black European and how important and how many shadows and Brandon, this very smart guy, sophomore, 19 years old, he is so, I was talking to Claude Steele about him. He, I can really connect with him in terms of this global post-colonial uh, situation. Not really so much post-colonial anymore, but global. I met him first because we were both students in Chinese language class, and he was better than I. So that ain't identitarianism. Neither he nor I are particularly Chinese. But at any rate, so he's, he's, my, uh, he's my implied reader. In 1935, W.E.B. Du Bois said of events after the opening of war in, as, in 1861, and I quote, as soon, however, as it became clear that the Union armies would not or could not return fugitive slaves, and that the masters with all their fume and fury were uncertain of victory, the slave entered upon a general strike against slavery by the same methods that he had used during the period of the fugitive slave. David Levering Lewis, Du Bois's extraordinary biographer, wrote as follows, I quote, analytical yet intuitive, densely researched but impressionistic, judicious and sweeping, Black Reconstruction pushed the figurative beyond the bounds of the historically permissible in its determination to integrate black labor into a Marxian schematic of proletarian overcoming. 
Du Bois says black worker, here he says fugitive slaves. Okay, we have to look at his, at his words. Generously interpreted, a general strike of the slaves was a valuable insight capable of factual corroboration, and he's right. A dictatorship of labor, however, was analytically much too fanciful, and I agree with him. The dictatorship of the pro proletariat was a fanciful idea from start to finish. I mean, Engels thought the commune was a dictatorship of the proletariat. It didn't last. We all know why it didn't last. International socialism sank on the unexamined bad faith of that idea. This is not the occasion to debate that one. The general strike did not carry that problem. Levering Lewis's generosity of interpretation gives Du Bois's invocation of the general strike a minimal riff, and I quote, Du Bois' general strike amounted to little more than the common sense of self-preservation exhibited on a massive scale. That's not what he's writing about. He's, he really, you know, I mean, I really shouldn't ad lib, but in terms of all that German stuff, right, which he kind of ch changed in some ways as some of us have changed deconstruction, mm -hmm. he was really actually trying to locate the subaltern speaking world historically mm -hmm in terms of the Hegelian thing, and then how to bring the individual subjective voice and the world historical voice together. That's also the secret of the education, it seems to me. So um, the, for Lewis, the norm of the general strike is Pelloutier and Sorel, and the image is, I quote Lewis, millions of workers in the great capitals of Europe acting in disciplined concert to paralyze reactionary governments. Now, if you take that as the model, you're not going to win. There's nothing going to, nothing's going to succeed anywhere. Go, certainly not Gandhi. So, you know, you've got you to gotta take a distance from that one. And um, uh, 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 the Russian Empire, uh, General Strike, certainly was not concerted anything. I mean, they lost all over the place. It went off into Azerbaijan. And the Russian Empire was huge and multicultural. It wasn't like, uh, it wasn't like London. At any rate, we must accept this brilliant historian statement that Du Bois knew of, I quote, the anarcho-syndicalist and anti-Leninist karma of this specific tradition. And I was thinking as I was writing, suppose I did a riff on this use of the word karma, or as I would say, karma. I could say, look, this is all wrong, you know, this can't be karma, etc. But that's not the way to go. That's not the way to go. The, uh, and of course, he knew the U.S. discussions of the general strike put forth by the Wobblies in his typewritten working papers for the Black Reconstruction, he notes for 1864, international adopts Marxism and was excited by the British general strike of 1926, as we can see in his handwritten notes to himself and his letters. I want to reopen the question on another register and ask, what was Du Bois's dream? Today we are in a situation when correct social scientific judgments can be statistically delivered. It is a moment when the humanities must show what they can bring to the understanding of a just world. It is in that context that I want to reopen the question of the black reconstruction and the general strike. I want to expand the general strike from Sorel and Pelloutier to Rosa Luxemburg and Antonio Gramsci. Some critics have argued that Gramsci was deeply influenced by Sorel in his work in prison, and indeed that his idea, Gramsci's idea, of epistemo epistemologizing Marxism came from Sorel. Certainly Sorel felt the importance of symbols of passion. For him, I quote, apocalypse corresponds perfectly to the general strike, which represents the advent of the new world to come. End of quote. Some of you here, if you, some of you undoubtedly have come to hear me because you're interested in Derrida, You'll see that this is a messianicity without messianism and uh, the, an avenir, eh? right there in Sorel. So it's the French tradition. Uh, he realized, as did Gramsci, of the importance of working class inclination being molded by such, quote, myths of the future. But he shares the romantic confidence in proletarian. Martin Luther King and Gandhi right here. The, uh, he shares that kind of proletarian confidence in proletarian consciousness that we have to relate to Gramsci's instrumentalization of the intellectual, to which we will come tomorrow. Thus we are led, he writes, by the observation of events among the proletariat to understand the value of the symbols employed by Marx. No realist will ever say this, ever. And they, in turn, permit us to appreciate the scope of the labor, labor movement as piety. And the basic difference remained that Gramsci, 
himself remaining, and you know, the last day, I'm going to talk about uh, my friend Saskia Sassen's kind of idealistic piety about uh, the labor export, the understanding everything about globalization. I'll come all the way to there. Okay, but uh, this is the problem with Sorel that neither Gramsci nor Du Bois shared. And the basic difference remained that Gramsci, himself remaining a democratic communist rather than a liberal democrat, wanted through Croce to turn the old order around rather than continue to suggest an impossible separatism. I quote, this is Sorel, an absolute separation of classes and on the abandonment of all hope for political reconstruction of the old order, end of quote. Tomorrow, I hope to concentrate on Gramsci and show that it is here that Du Bois and Gramsci dream together in two related yet discontinuous historical moments, although they did not know each other. At least, we don't think so. Uh, du Bois admired Stalin and had an unquestioning admiration for the Soviet Union and China. Unquestioning. I do not want to enter that dispute. I only wish that he had said about Stalin what he said about his choice of Bismarck as the subject of his valedictorian address at Fisk at the age of 20. And I quote, Du Bois would reproach himself, writes Levering Lewis in an unpublished lecture that he gave, Levering Lewis gave in Berlin, for an address that revealed, as Du Bois said, the abyss between my education and the truth in the world. Wish the mature Du Bois was able to say that about Stalin, but he didn't, alas. Only in this case, the appropriate words from this obstinate man might have been between my back against the wall and the truth in the world. I mean, one has to think about being dismissed from the UN uh, planning and all of that stuff. Before, I'm not an apologist, but nonetheless, this is something, once again, we have to think about in uh, many different ways. I set out here my simple politics of reading. Since it is impossible to find someone who is completely politically correct, even as we do not excuse, we also, and this will be very important when we think about Sister Carby, even as we do not excuse, we also do not let the accusation throw out the thinking out of court if it seems an important enough text I try to enter its protocols. Now, the protocols are not the same as reasons. Like, you know, in Thailand, the professors were kneeling when the princess came in. Because, you know, I'm Nehru and Gandhi and stuff. I'm not going to crawl before a human being. I stood like this. I stood like this. Okay, I didn't move. But they were crawling. And it's a queen, you back out, right? That's protocols. Those are the protocols of a text. That's not like exactly the reasonableness. Anyway. So I try to enter its protocols, its private grammar, so that I can find a spot in the text where I can locate myself and turn it around, perhaps against its own grain, or perhaps to make it more faithful to itself, its, its declared convictions, as Mary Prince did for the abolitionists. Do not excuse, do not, do not accuse, enter, earn the right, turn it around, and use. See, this is something that I hope to be doing with dark water on the last day. Now, um, the story goes that Kisa Gautami came to Gautama Buddha in great distress at the death of her son. The Buddha said to her, if you can bring me a bowl of seeds from a house where there has been no death, I will bring your son back to life. She came back empty-handed and a heart full of philosophical consolation. Every culture has some version of this method, the exhortation not to cast stones. Levering Lewis is right in noticing that the 145,000 Negroes acted in self-interest. What the Negro did, Du Bois writes, was to wait, look and listen, and try to see where his interest lay. To change the self-interested subject of the general strike into a citizen of a democratic communist state so that he will think about others. That's the double bind, that's the allegory of reading within democracy, right? Ipsity and others. So autonomy and others. So that's the project. It's not a cancellation. To change the self-interested subject of the general strike into a citizen of a democratic communist state of the future is where the project of the education lay. If this recodes Du Bois, there is a model to be found in Martin Luther King's reading of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. Briefly put, Gandhi was by cultural production reformed orthodox Hindu with dreadful gender politics a paradox possible in colonial India. 
I believe he tried to assimilate what he perceived as the Hindu or, quote, Indian doctrine, the 19th century Semitized Hinduism. It's a huge phenomenon from within which Gandhi was recoding himself, taking off his suit and putting on his ball bag. The, uh, so the, what I believe he tried to assimilate what he perceived as the Hindu or, quote, Indian doctrine of ahimsa or nonviolence and the Hindu or, quote, Indian exhortation for satyagraha or the will to truth into the theater of decolonization. This is what he was uh, up to. Martin Luther King read him in, as a Christian liberation theologian. It is no doubt important on the register of ex exactitude to point out that this may be an incorrect reading. If you look at uh, you know, the subaltern studies work, for example, on Gandhi's own politics in relation to uh, the peasant movements and so on, it may be. On the register of truth, that's the register of exactitude. On the register of truth, the question to ask is, what was Martin Luther King's dream of Gandhi? So to an extent, I take, I ask for indulgence because I want you to think of this. Because I can tell you seriously, as a person from the Indian left, our reading of Gandhi is very different. I'm just going to read a little bit, little stuff from uh, King that you know in order to set the stage. It was the Sermon on the Mount writes Dr. King, rather than a doctrine of passive resistance that initially inspired the Negroes of Montgomery to dignified social action. As the days unfolded, however, the inspiration of Mahatma Gandhi began to exact its influence. I had come to see early that the Christian doctrine of love operating, this is a Gandhi who lies between two nubile women to, pr to prove that he's not moved, I had come to see early that the Christian doctrine of love operating through the Gandhian method of nonviolence was one of the most potent weapons available to the Negro in his struggle for freedom. Nonviolent resistance had emerged as the technique of the movement while love stood as the regulating ideal. In other words, Christ furnished the spirit and motivation while Gandhi furnished the method. So to an extent, and I'm deeply respectful of Mahatma Gandhi. I certainly feel that he was an incredibly uh, powerful uh, man capable of unbelievable political theater so that uh, finally what happened was that that took over. It was a dream itself excited me as Yeats would write. It's not excited, but I've forgotten what the word is. Maybe somebody, will, uh, Helen Wendler wouldn't be caught dead coming to this, but <laughs> nonetheless, you know, if she had been in the audience, she would know what the real word is. But that's, 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 that's what uh, Martin Luther King is looking at, okay? And so I'm saying, if you uh, be, be indulgent towards this kind of recoding. Let me then say that I have tried to imagine this moment in Black Reconstruction to a I have tried to integrate, sorry, this moment in Black Reconstruction to a broad dream of international justice after the death of the colonies. We know today that the dream was only partially fulfilled. The obligation to take it up again rests on our shoulders. It is in that spirit, then, that I begin this initial lecture. For Du Bois, the entry into the University of Berlin was cataclysmic. He felt that there was no prejudice there against him. We've read all that stuff. And he breathed the air of a certain intellectual freedom, rightly or wrongly. He didn't actually get into a mentee relationship with Richard Bernstein, but nonetheless, it was Richard Bernstein, he was a very canny person, uh, Du Bois, young uh, man. Richard Bernstein opened a debate with Rosa Luxemburg, the fiery Polish-Jewish revolutionary, whose first experience of a revolution had been the general strike of 1905. It is possible to imagine that some of the mindset that entered the Bernstein-Luxemburg de debates had been imparted to the young Du Bois as he was breathing in the atmosphere of the University of Berlin. Uh, you know, f uh, f this a few decades after Marx. Uh, du Bois uh, might have read Crook's contemporary account of the general strike, but for him, 1905 and 1906 were the birth of the Niagara movement. He was not really looking at, the, at what was happening in Moscow, or as he called it, the Niagara movement. Uh, in his own handwritten notes to himself, he makes clear that it is the general strike of 1926 in Great Britain that was his example. And yet, how far was the event of the Black Reconstruction from that event? In order to get a sense of the dream that could bridge this gap, let us look briefly at the idea of the general strike. It is the idea of collective action coming from below, from the worker, 
from the proletarian against the employer, not necessarily accompanied by violence, and not the intervention from intellectuals morally outraged into a politics of regime change accompanied by violence, usually called a revolution. One can say that in the idea of the general strike is contained the hope of a generally non-violent expression of the worker understanding that he or she is the agent of production and not the beneficiary of job creation. This was the lesson that Marx wanted to teach the worker. A general strike is thus proof for the inter leftist intellectual that, or the leftist leader of Marx's success as a teacher. Violent regime change was not an essential part of Marxist theory. All of the letter exchange on uh, Russia, you, it's there in existence. The, you can now see that for someone like Rosa Luxemburg, the fact of the general strike of 1905 was altogether more in line with Marxist thinking than the February or October revolutions of 1917. This is also why many think that Marx did not write upon the revolutionary subject. Thinking of this time then, this was the tradition of the general strike that intellectuals with some sense of the left almost took for granted. It was the workers showing the owners that they, the workers, ran the enterprise. Violence was not an integral part of it. In other words, the general strike seemed to assure, as I say, that the worker had learned Marx's lesson. By thinking of the subaltern outside of capital logic, Gramsci in Europe moved us out of Europe. By positing a general strike for the black slaves, so did Du Bois, almost at the same time, in America, not in America. Even as the CPUSA is trying to decide if the Negro situation is exploitation, racism, or internal colonialism. This is a fantastic moment. The thing for us is not to sit in judgment and say, hey, he's wrong. You know, it's like the copy editor, excuse me for uh, falling from the uh, sublime to the ridiculous. I wrote my first little book with a very 1960s ideal for young adults, okay? But I was a demand student. So I used the word allegory all along the way, the book on Yeats. And the copy editor cut each one as a symbol. And so I had to, and then the introduction to the grammatology. I, I mean, the new deconstructivist. I write all the names of Derrida's texts, and I say, these texts are also Jacques Derrida. And the copy editor writes back, no, Jacques Derrida is a man. So to an extent, when we sit down, we sit down in judgment on Du Bois to decide as to whether he's correct or incorrect about the general strike, we are like history's copy editors. It's an absurdity. Anyway, so I'm not knocking copy editors. I adore copy editors. Some of my best friends are copy editors, if I may say so. <laughs> Sorry, that was a bad, was bad joke. Bad joke, okay? Forgive me. I love you. The, okay, so even as the CPUSA is trying, Du Bois is dreaming a world, world historical, not yet a personal, voice for the African American subaltern. No hyphens there, commas only, not yet together. But he's imagining, he's dreaming a world historical voice. How to bring the personal and the world historical together is also already the issue. The literary reader prays to be haunted by this ghost in the text. I will attempt to do so by welcoming dream work, but not yet. Now, there was, of course, another thinking of the general strike more closely related to the French tradition, where violence was indeed integral to the general strike, which would emerge only if the worker was able to think of every situation as split into two poles. This is the tradition of Georges Sorel, in whose book, entitled Reflections on Violence, the terms are laid out. In literary criticism, the best example of this tradition is Walter Benjamin's magnificent essay, A Critique of Violence, where the German word Die Gewalt denotes force, violence, power, and gives philosophical enrichment to the idea of the general strike coming in a line from Sorel. That is not Du Bois's line, and therefore we will not pursue the fascinating trajectory of the changes to the Sorelian thinking of the general strike. I have remarked elsewhere upon Benjamin's conviction that the educative power is a form of appearance of what he calls divine power because it breaks the crime expiation chain that the law deals with. And yet the educative, writes Benjamin, does not depend upon miracles for its definition. In this hope, in the displacing power of education, Benjamin touches Du Bois. 
Du Bois, blessed with a longer life, proposes that in this displacing power is the possibility of wrenching the world historical into the individual. I'm following C.L.R. James. As a feminist, I will say that we cannot dismiss this because Du Bois' gender politics were commonplace, personal gender politics. And as an activist, I say that the historian cannot dismiss this as incorrect, and certainly not the culturalist identitarian. As an activist, I will say so. Um, du Bois himself had only that early experience of teaching at a village school in the South. I assure you, the weave of that experience, later, of course, he taught like us, but uh, I assure you, the weave of that experience got woven into his life. Weave, in Latin, texere, intertextuality in the textile, not just the verbal text, as we have been assuring people for the last 40 years. You cannot forget the lesson of the experience of teaching the cognitively damaged rural subaltern. And, and I mean, colonialism is young. I'm talking about people who were undone by thousands of years of absolutely stopping intellectual labor, my own kind in West Bengal, right? So this thing, you cannot, and the kind of cognitive damage I'll be very happy to dis, uh, describe. It's not saying, oh, they can't think. No, it's something else. The, so you cannot forget the lesson of the experience of teaching the cognitively damaged rural subaltern, altogether different from the urban subproletariat and almost the reverse of international civil society fundraising educational efforts today. I will pick this back up tomorrow. So, although Marx did not specifically endorse the general strike, if we kept close to his thinking, the idea would involve the worker rather than the ideologue as agent. Remember that Marx described himself as a bourgeois ideologue for the worker in the postface to the second edition of Capital Volume 1. We all know about the collective project of helping our brother Karl write Volume 1, the only book he ever wrote, so that it should become a teaching text for the worker in order for him or her to understand that she already moved the world of capital, and a general strike would certainly show that. André Gars perceptively asks about our global society, where waged work is shrinking, and uh, heart and maybe you go like the immaterial labor, etc. Where waged work is shrinking, and I quote, what does it mean under these conditions, quote, to be a socialist, he asks. If it means fighting for the emancipation of the workers, then socialists are merely the elitist ideological spokespersons for those 15%, and his figures are German, 15% who still define themselves chiefly by their work. That work on which the consciousness of belonging to the working class was built, the awareness of having interests as a worker which are opposed to those of capital. In other words, as Hannah Arendt said about the nation state, this phenomenon is a contained moment within history. Du Bois and Gramsci are both talking about something much bigger. You can't just use these as references. I quote this here to show that the question of the relationship between ideologue and worker within socialism has not disappeared only displaced because, to quote Asia Labor Monitor, I quote, the factory floor has been pulverized. Gortz agonizes after industrial capitalism. Gramsci thinks beyond industrial capitalism, Du Bois before. Gortz is in Germany, Gramsci in clan-ridden southern Italy, Du Bois in African America. We gotta, this is what C.L.R. James teaches me. That this is how I gotta proceed. Now, in the case of Gandhi, who certainly spoke of the general strike in some of his English as well as some of his Gujarati writings, there is a further twist. Since he was not identified with the popular movements in India, and certainly not with the left, in his hands, the general strike became what the Japanese philosopher Kojin Karatani has recommended for the middle class around the world, the passive resistance of boycott politics. Subject building for him remained within the vagaries of reform Hinduism. It is interesting that toward the end of his life, Du Bois, lecturing in Wisconsin and accepting that the Negro episteme had been transformed, described the self-aware Negroes as boycotting. Whereas, writing on the Black Reconstruction, the illiterate and unorganized Negro population of the Black Reconstruction were general strikers. Boycotting, general strikers, the contrast. What is at stake here is to recognize a collective subject and plan for a future of this subject. This is where the discourse of Marx accomplishes a dream. Now let me tell you my plan. 
My plan, it is now, I've just spoken for 50 minutes, and I'm beginning to bore you. Uh, well, you know, I kind of, I, I know, I'm just kicking in. But on the other hand, what I'm going to see, the thing is, uh, I, I could, I, talks are not very long, okay? So I could go on to read about how I use, I mean, like, yeah, 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 and I don't hear you. 50 minutes, I think, is cool. So what I do here is um, talk about how, uh, how I make the dream my allegory of reading, wh what an allegory of reading means, once again. Um, and, um, um, and then I go on to talk a little more about what uh, Du Bois was up to. I don't think you're going to, I don't think it's, it's, it's going to hurt, hurt me if I don't speak anymore. So let's just do this and just let me just read the last three paragraphs and uh, let's have a discussion. And tomorrow I will begin by reading what I'm not reading today. And this is the way we'll go. Okay. All right. So the last three paragraphs. Times are wonderful in the last paragraph, okay? You don't know. You don't know what I really said, so I'm totally, totally ignoring the lesson of not keeping in suspense. I mean, come on, I can't just. Uh, times, however, have changed. Because of the explosion of inf information and the apparent facility of interpretation when information command is mistaken for thinking, our model for thinking becomes reducing the relief map of the text to a level playing field for an evidence-mongering judgment that resembles the assumption of crowdsourcing as unmediated democracy. This is most unfortunate, especially I'm not a Luddite, but we need to know how to use medicine so it doesn't become poison. This is most unfortunate, especially in the case of the great counterintuitive thinkers such as Kant, Marx, Frederick Douglass, Du Bois. In order to access their use of the counterintuitive, the reading of the reconstruction of general strike slips in here, we are now better prepared to see both the necessity and the impossibility as inhabiting the field of history, the gift of globalization. Tomorrow, I want to bring Du Bois and Gramsci together by way of the general strike into their thoughts on an education for bringing up the subaltern subject to coincide with world history. Toward the end of his life, involved in macro political statements, a bit of a roughed up demagogic lion, he is no, du Bois is no longer focusing so hard on non-vocational education, yet the presuppositions and convictions are still intact. Praising China somewhat excessively, although I, as an Indian, know and share his sentiments, he adds the essential phrase, I quote, human nature was being so changed. Changing human nature so that it can be encountered by its world historical behavior. We will speak of this tomorrow. And I promise you, I will speak on how I use the dream, which I didn't read. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, it was marvelous. Marvelous questions, uh, comments. You, um, you know, because we're webcasting, um, you have to speak in the microphone, so this can all be... Oh, but I wasn't speaking. No, I, I, I. I'll, uh, I'll start. Oh, I got you. Oh, you got you. <laughs> so, Gayatri, um, can you hear me okay? A lot of people haven't here, obviously, would not have read Black Reconstruction, you see. So that um, it's important, I think, for them to understand exactly the gesture that Du Bois was making. So maybe you could just back up a little bit and explain what the reference is, okay? Okay, well he is referring to, uh, you know, the fact that there was, for example, I mean you must know about the amendments to the Constitution, right? We yes. can start from there, 14th and 15th, right? Right, 13th, 14th. 13th, 14th and 15th, and 15th. Right. there we go. And the 15th is, of course, not a female, but uh, suffrage. Right. Huh? So, to an extent, what we are talking about is, and that's the first federal anti-poverty program, mm -hmm. although it rode Andrew J um, uh, Jackson's uh, thing, veto, mm -hmm. you know, it's nonetheless, in 1865, the establishment of what it's, the real name of it is the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, okay? Mm -hmm. It was that's established right. by the U.S. government, and, <clears throat> the, and to protect the rights of freed slaves in the South. 
It helped to build Negro hospitals and schools, set up courts, and assisted in labor negotiations between former slaves and southern businessmen and farmers. The Bureau was dissolved in 1872. This is just a description, okay, and then there are those. In, not only in Black Reconstruction, which is, if many people haven't read it, maybe I should show the size of the book. Okay. <laughs> it's a big book. Printed very, very small. See, it ain't a little book like uh, anything. Right. So, the, uh, the, in this book, as well as in the souls of black folk, Du Bois uh, bitterly, uh, bitterly laments the fact that the 15th Amendment came to nothing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in the souls of black folk, in terms of education, exactly. That's right. But in uh, what he's, uh, d uh, w in 1910, I think, he wrote an essay which was uh, 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 forgotten on the advantages of this, uh, this Freedmen's Bureau and the Black Reconstruction, where he says that what the reason, the, what happened when the uh, when this um, these amendments and this uh, thing was passed? What happened was that the there were three things: the Negro schools, mm -hmm. the Negro churches, and the Freedmen's Bureau. That together, in fact, they were the, in the language I'm using or Gramsci would use, they put the subaltern in onto the road to hegemony. Yes. And w uh, I will use a quote from, I'm glad you asked me this question because I was hoping somebody would ask. I'll use a quote from, uh, from Levering Lewis's biographer. Uh, the um, General Sherman's special order number 15, giving emancipated, uh, 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 possessory, em emancipated Negroes uh, possessory titles to 40 acres of land in Georgia and South Carolina. The federal, uh, the, the Freedmen's Bureau's success in feeding, clothing, negotiating work contracts, and educating 247,333 new citizens in 4,329 4, elementary schools, the first federal anti-poverty program, and protecting black voters and office holders under the Civil Rights Act of 1875, according to Du Bois, this failed because of what he calls the American assumption. And what is the American assumption? Pray tell. Deeply racistically colored racialized conviction uh, of possessive individualism. That the individual creates wealth, not abolition democracy, do not trust the state. Does it, does it, does it sound familiar? <laughs> does it sound familiar? So uh, that's what, so what Du Bois was seeing in this abolition democracy, this Reconstruction was, and, and on the last day, in terms of, in terms of feminism, I'm going to read. You know them well, but uh, if uh, there may be people in the audience who don't know them, declarations of the Negroes who actually participated in the Freedmen's Bureau. It wasn't just a handout, and so, and in fact, black and white came together in extraordinary uh, ways. So Du Bois, to an extent, saw this also as a welfare state socialist. Uh, experiment which came to nothing because of, his words, the American assumption, race and capital combined. So that's what I was talking about, and that's what this is. Black Reconstruction in America, 1860 to 1880. And the thing is, you know, my colleague, um, Eric Foner, uh, who's a fantastic, fantastic historian. And who just gave the uh, messenger lectures here last week on Lincoln and race. Oh, there we go. Then you know him. So uh, he's fantastic. But on the other hand, and in fact, one of the guys who are writing about, uh, maybe Gleberman, says he possesses the Reconstruction. But what the huge difference between Eric Foner's fantastic book on the Black Reconstruction, full of pictures and so on, which one uses to teach, and Du Bois's book is, you know, if I'm in class, I'll say, what's the difference? Have you noticed? But I'll tell you what it is. Du Bois has running through chapters on education. Fauna's book is a historian's book. They're both called the Black Reconstruction. But in Du Bois, the real theme is, in fact, education. And there are chapters on education, the propaganda of history, etc. because of what I was saying. The idea is not just to describe the past, but to bring it into the present looking toward the future. Wonderful question. Right. Skip, but you were saying, just one quick follow-up, and then I'll open it up. But, you know, it's no accident that 
when you gave the example of um, uh, superficial intervention that you used the word allegory, because your lecture is all about allegory. The, the voice, and there are three terms, the, there are three events that are allegorizing each other. Reconstruction, the general strike of 1905, and the moment of writing, which is the Great Depression, right? So the Du Bois is trying to find roots of a Marxist, uh, a proto-Marxist union of workers to over between black and white, black subjects who see economic interests more than race, um, and then the possibility, in using that as the possibility for a new fusion, a revolutionary fusion of black and white as capitalism appears to be crumbling in 1935 when he's writing Black Reconstruction. Is Which that is correct? why then I brought it forth to right. uh, the healthcare stuff. Right? Yeah, and, and, so and why you kicked Gandhi in his uh, bare ribs, uh, by the go. way, too. Yeah, let's keep it, we can let's, keep it let's, right. Let's keep it polite here. <laughs> but uh, so what, what, we, what I'm also try, trying to say is that those first black slaves who did the general strike, they were not particularly thinking of the economic more than the ratio. Mm -hmm. You see, I think it, it is uh, not possible for me to imagine that, I mean, people speaking up, I'll read those quotes, like I said, at the Freedmen's Bureau, mm -hmm. they were not just talking about economic. I mean, no. when the guy says, I mean, I'll uh, say this, you know, when the guy says that he, uh, my father bought me for 300 bucks, right? Mm -hmm. And then he, uh, his son, uh, sold me for a thousand dollars, my father's son, right? right? And so then the figure of the mother, what does it become? Eh? This, uh, that's certainly, I mean, he's mentioning economics that I was bought for 300 bucks and sold for a thousand bucks, right? right? But that's not an economic statement. No. And he's speaking as a member of the Freedmen's Bureau. He's not just kind of talking like complaining from the audience. Mm -hmm. So he's a legislator. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me a slave. So, an ex-slave. So, to an extent, it seems to me that when uh, Gramsci or Du Bois think of the subaltern, they're not thinking that their economic interests come before their <coughs> racial identification. So, to an extent, Fair that's, enough. yeah. Okay, questions, comments? Uh, Skip, you're gonna recognize the people? Oh. Uh, that's what you said to Homie. Yeah. Yeah, a quick point that Reconstruction didn't just fail, but it was violently crushed by the forces of white supremacy with the accomplice, accomplice of, of the state. But my question, speaking to Lenin, because this, this dilemma of going from self-interest to what I would call emancipators of humanity, Lenin spoke to that very eloquently in what is to be done in this whole process of bringing forward emancipators to actually make a revolution, which Du Bois was very sympathetic to. Yeah, but it didn't work. The, the thing is, you know, uh, talking the talk and walking the walk, I mean, that's why I say international socialism has a huge ethics-shaped hole. I'm not alone in saying this. Theodor Shanin has made the point that there was no time with all of the, we need vanguards. We cannot, in fact, anybody who's done anything, even if you say there won't be a vanguard, it'll only be a popular vanguard, we all know that some people who can really work are the ones who get all the work. That's what a vanguard is, or a steering committee. You may call it what you like. It has no name, but it's doing all the work, right? That's a vanguard. So to an extent, this supplementing of the vanguardism, that's, you know, that's what Gramsci was thinking about because he was sitting in jail, you know, because the vanguard is not going to be enough. Something is going to fail the people who have not been taken care of, the ordinary people's epistemological transformation. Gramsci says Marxist project is epistemological. They're going to bring it down. And you know the whole thing about East Europeans wanting bad capitalism. Yeah? So uh, Central Asians falling back into clan politics, all of that stuff. That's the kind of thing that we need to think about. And of course, thing, um, uh, Levering Lewis's point is that by saying general strike, uh, Du Bois is, is with the anarcho-syndicalists doing an anti-Lenin karma. Right. So whatever, yeah, those are important details. But to be the crushed stuff, yes, important. Not just failed, but crushed. Thank you. I greatly appreciate the framework that you gave us before your formal presentation to make certain that we understand that we're going to focus on the act of self-justification and how it can possibly become a moral, uh, an act that's morally open to others. 
So my question to you is framed by this concern. I wonder if it's accurate to suggest that the slaves, when free, were not already interested in the welfare of others. And I ask the question framed by two points. One, Booker T. Washington's first class graduation class of eight, 5,000 persons came to it because there was such a drive for education. And two, from Du Bois' black reconstruction, as you know, he says again and again, the fundamental issue of slavery was a labor issue, and it split the laboring classes. And thus, perhaps we had the drive for others morally from the freed slaves in the general strike, but half the proletariat was still caught up in the crisis of identity, the white subaltern, which made it impossible for a consciousness to come to the fore and remain in place because of the structures that prevented it. So I question your premise. Yes, and I uh, agree with you. I think you're right. But I'm, what I'm trying to say is that history is not just uh, 70 years that the Soviet Union had, yes? In the first flush of escaping from such a tremendous, completely humanity-denying collective experience, which also had with it, I can't speak really for Africa here because we tend to be a little romantic. I don't know. But it seems to me that that's not what we are talking about. What we are talking about is when everything falls into place, Du Bois' 1948 remark about why he was wrong about the talented tenth because it would produce high rollers. I'm going to read that the day we read. We read. Uh, so uh, my idea is not what happens in the aftermath of this kind of euphoria of liberation as well as the extraordinary sharing experience that that kind of absolute misery brings. I'm with you, but it does not last. And history is not just confined to the noble fallout of extraordinary violence from the other side. It begins to continue in a mundane and commonplace way. And so, the, in fact, even the uh, idea of sharing Let's forget how it beca be begins to get transformed into so-called development. We're not going there. But even the idea of sharing, at best, begins to become sharing with my own crowd. And my experience is not, of course, I mean, I wasn't there when the slaves were liberated. I read like, like the subaltern studies folks read. But in the current experience, this experience of the subalterns around the world in biodiversity festivals, in my schools with different kinds of community. India has um, 300 plus Austro-Asiatic tribes apart from the regular Indians so-called like us, right? The feeling of non-sharing. Um, so this is what I was saying about Saskia Sassen's talk about those labor export folks in globalization really sharing. I agree. But those are phenomenal descriptions. I don't think they go in theoretically into the future. And here theory is not a bad word like book writing. It's a word which guides us into thinking something beyond our intuition. This is why I believe Du Bois is somewhat counterintuitive. And so I'm, I'm, I agree with you. But the premise is much bigger than the empirical possibilities of what happens after that, or the declarations made about the nature of Africa itself. It seems to me that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, this is perfect. Beautiful, perfect. Uh, <laughs> Hi. Um, my question was on how, um, how one learns to aspire or relearns to aspire from a crumbling edifice, as you said. So. I'm interested in clarifying and thinking through a little further your use of the word dream in relation to politics mm. and what use you're trying to put it to, because it's clearly, it stands for some mode of orientation, some form of aspiration. You're not, it's not exactly a psychoanalytic use you're making of it. It's not some form of working through trauma. 
right? No, but if no. you think through it further, it's not just literal that you're putting it to. It's some kind of mode of aspiration. Uh, but on the other hand, that mode of aspiration probably has threats internal to it because the dream could be a nightmare. It could turn out to be an illusion. There's a question of what one does after we wake up, right? So, so the question I think that you're being led to somehow, despite the stress on the subaltern, is what constitutes a model of aspiration or who aspires or what kind of dreamer we are attracted towards. So do you think that the encounter with Du Bois, if it is to be an encounter, and an encounter is something that changes you in some way also, do you think it might, through the network of thought that you're tapping into, might lead you towards a different picture of Gandhi, for example, than yeah, that exactly. which we inherited from the Indian left? And I don't think so. Is this, uh, that's a big question. Can I uh, yeah, start from here? That's it. Really. Okay, I won't really talk about Gandhi because the guy who, uh, what's his name now? I should really know his name. The wonderful guy who's written about Du Bois' dialectics. Who remembers? It's a wonderful book, young man. He uh, proposes something very interesting. Again, my former students in this room, you know that I have a, uh, I have a school of, uh, school of uh, criticism that I talk about, which is nothing butism. Okay, so uh, you know, Derrida is nothing but the poor man's Nietzsche, okay, and Tarara is nothing but ta ta ta. And I always ask, okay, fine, fine, but how about thinking beyond, like, where are they not similar? Uh, those, uh, you know, those uh, of you that I see, that's one of mine. But this guy who's written Du Bois's Dialectics, whom I hadn't read before uh, I started work on this paper, has another one quickly mentioned in Parsonism. You know, so you mentioned Du Bois, Fanon, <laughs> you know, all of these nice black names, and then you pass on to some other thing. Okay, how often have we not seen this? And you also, this, as you mentioned, queer, HIV AIDS, ta-da, and you pass on, to, <laughs> pass on to some other thing. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk about, because I don't want Du Bois to be a, mention in Passonism to Gandhi, okay, so I'm not going to talk at great length about Gandhi, but I think in order for me to change, look, I Got up, I grew up in a family where my mother learned to do the Lati Kala with Pulindash, and my dad was a Gandhian. Okay? So I'm, I take my mother's side. <laughs> so for me, for me to, to read. Okay. To but the word dream? I respect him. Dream I'm coming to. I respect him. Dream, dream you've, put a, you've put your finger on a very uh, wonderful uh, problem with what I was saying, which is this uh, Marx has a great problem with the word social. Eh? The, one, of the, one of the uses of the word which you see in his whole idea of abstract average, fair gesellschafted, etc., he makes up words. That is the, the idea of labor quantification being homeopathic. So the workers themselves should choose it and then use the capital to build a just society. That is social. On the other hand, he also has the whole humanist PhD from Berlin on Greek philosophy baggage of a very broad notion of the social, which means you and I are happy in our homes and so on. Okay? So that's one of the problems. And my word dream was being used with that problem in it. So you have put your finger on it. I am talking about what was Du Bois's dream and what was, but in fact, the reason uh, when, if I had discussed my model of, my allegory of reading as the dream work, you would have seen that that, uh, I mean, I was like being just a little tricky there. I was trying to win you over by using the word dream, you know what I mean? So, uh, and uh, you know, but, the, and I was using it metaphorically. But in fact, I'm not a Freudian, as uh, Homi said, uh, for and against, but, I, what I would like to suggest is, and that's part of the talk tomorrow, I mean not tomorrow, but in today's talk, that the literary way of looking at dreams as giving a clue to how reason, uh, reason works itself out is as ancient as human record. And the Europeans who, and Rosalind Morris, my friend, said, oh, God, there was capitalism in China. I said, Ros, don't go that Marvin Harris stuff. I'm talking about something. You know what I'm talking about. So I said, you know, Europeans, having had access to the abstract as such, capital and capitalism, they, in fact, did well 
taking this in many different kinds of ways into describing reality. And I believe that Freud's dream work is that kind of a thing. Not because I'm a Freudian, but because it's this kind of, uh, kind of uh, you know, I talk about abusing the Enlightenment, etc. It's the kind of abstraction that we get from the European 19th century. So uh, almost at the same time, the souls of black folk. So that stuff, condensation, displacement, overdetermination, secondary division, that to me is just as logical a way of reading rhetorically because otherwise we get 16th century rhetoric which is based on a very simple idea of the human mind, right? So that to me is as reasonable as the idea that a minimalized evidentiary a syllogism is what we all share as human beings, and it's called reason. So that is not actually um, very much more than literal. But you're completely right. I was finessing my argument because I was afraid to, in fact, uh, question the kind of assumption that you have made, because that kind of stuff sounds like I'm not speaking from inside. So therefore, I was trying to win you by using the extreme metaphorical charge of the word dream in one way or another. But I don't think Du Bois is going to read into that. I think Du Bois' stuff about India, Du Bois' stuff about anti-colonialism is wonderful. The, you, know, you know, the pre-Bandung stuff, can I mechanism into anti-colonialism. But the stuff about India, once again, you know, I could just sit in judgment and say, ta-da, dark princess, a Brahmin girl. You know what I mean? So, you know. Yeah, um, I have just one problem here, and that is with the inclusion of Sorel in this context. Because you see, the, the reflections on violence, you know, it's not really, it talks about the general strife, but I mean, it's really about some kind of uh, psychological, even mystic experience. Mystical. Christian, and, Catholic. Yeah, and in fact, it's not surprising that he became a conservative, very right wing. In fact, he became a fascist. Yes. So one is wondering exactly what he's doing in this conflict. Professor Irele, you have made me extremely happy. I put him in there because Levering Lewis puts him there, and I thought, Gaiti, you don't know anything. This is the biographer. Put him in there. No. I want Gramsci and Rosa Luxemburg, the younger folk who were worrying about, I would be very happy to let Sorel go. Uh, you, you have, you're correct. Sorel doesn't have a place there, and especially because of what happened to him in the future and all that Catholic stuff. No, no. Thank you. You talked a lot about the um, sort of practice okay, of um, reading generously and, and sort of hearing generously and not judging too harshly from our particular kind of vantage point. And on the other hand, you also talked about ignoring one's sort of individual identity as part of a kind of larger world historical um, moment. Um, and I guess what I would ask is, how would you describe the process through which one would sort of avoid foreclosing prematurely, right? A avoid the moment of saying, my identity um, I can see how my identity then does speak for the world historic historical actor, as opposed to sort of constantly bringing that assumption into um, uh, into doubt, debate, et cetera. So can you talk a little bit about just, you know, some thoughts about how that would Only work? Only to say that I share that problem. To, sh I, to say that I share that problem. I don't think that one, uh, on the other hand, that doesn't mean you solve it too quickly. You know? And you agree with me there. Mm -hmm. I don't think one should ignore one's identity. I don't think one's identity can be ignored. B uh, if we say I, there's something there. It's just that when that is not resisted at all, that's when the problem uh, comes, you know. Uh, so it's this, you know you can really produce a great deal of resistance just pulling like that, right? And that's just your two hands. So that's what I'm trying to say. It's a, it's a very salutary um, exercise, it seems to me, but I don't have the answer. It's a very risky thing, you know, sapere aude. It's a very, very risky thing uh, that, uh, you know, to go this way. 
That's why one also needs indulgence, because otherwise one always wants to fall back on what is just the very general rule, which is my kind knows the, how uh, the cultural change works, which is legitimized by reversal when you say my kind knows nothing. You see, you see what I mean? See, that, I don't want to be, one life to live, I don't want to be caught in that one. That's really maybe a personal obsession that I can't justify uh, reasonably and logically. That's what it is. Maybe it's that one more. In addition to being brilliant, as you can see, he's a fan of style. <laughs> Final question, just a quick, quick question, quick answer, and then we have food and drink. Lindsay, you're going to talk to Martin Kilson about his contract. Yes, you're done. Hi, actually, this, this arose. Um, out of your answer to, I Where think, are this, you? I'm here, hi. Oh, okay, that's what I'm yes. This arose out of your answer to the second question, also addressing you as a Bengali. As you, uh, um, You're a Bengali? No, addressing you. I'm uh, a Bengali. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, <sorry. laughs> um, but you reminded me, uh, thinking of this Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, his, his notion of Preeti, okay, by which I mean a kind of love which is a pragmatic compromise with the impossibility of loving all humanity as he saw it, and therefore he came down to the nation. You can break down your barriers and your jati and all this, and you can work together in that collectivity, which raises the question of that itself is a collectivity. It's higher than the individual kind of interest. Where's the, and my, my question to you is, uh, in yourself, I'd love to hear, but at least in Du Bois and, and Gramsci, where's that cut off from quantity to something which transcends and which becomes genuinely universal? I don't think any, either of them are really thinking about the universal as such, or I could put it this way. The, when they are thinking of the universal, that is not where I connect with them, because I mean, that's why I made that joke, not a joke, but a comment about the other use of social in Marx. But that, you may put that down to my generation. We were really, uh, for me, the singular is the universalizable, the, the difference that can be repeated. But the universal has always been, if your mother hasn't read Shakespeare, then she's not universal. So it's hard for um, us to really think of universal in any other way than learning the Oxbridge shuffle. And certainly Bonkim Chandra, as deputy magistrate, was within that as well. Now, Bonkin Chandro, again, I don't want to do, uh, I don't want to do, uh, yeah, there we go. I, I don't want to do uh, nothing but ism here, okay, or just mention quickly and go. But what the hell, you know, this is the last question. So, <laughs> Bonkin Chandro Chattopadhyay, who was a novelist and certainly, uh, uh, what, what's her face, what is her name now, come on, probably teaches here. Everybody teaches here. Uh, wait a second. Wait a second. White. No, she's white. She's totally white. Man, she's French. What are you? So, oh, come on. No. Pascal Casanova. Okay, I really had forgotten her name. She's a very nice person. But her, are you here, Pascal? No. Okay. Her, I know. She teaches at Yale, I think. Huh? But at any rate, she, her book, in her book, she talks about everybody who has read it in Scott. But think that a person who's writing about the World Republic of Letters has never heard of Von Kim Chandru, Dr. Paddai. This is only a huge country. Yeah? And he himself said that he was you know, inspired by Scott at all. Okay, so this is the guy. But you see, my problem with Von Kim Chandru talking about Priti, which is a kind of love, which is not Prem, but uh, more like Agape than Eras and so on and so forth. Okay. My problem with that, that if one begins to look at the, I've written about this actually, a piece called Translating into English in a volume edited by Sandra Berman and Michael Wood. The, if one looks at it from the point of view of the extraordinary series of, of uh, 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 extraordinary journal that he edited in order really to establish Bengali nationalism as Indian nationalism, 
longer than one. What one sees is, and I used in, in published prose a very violent phrase, you'll forgive me, uh, the, what you see is the ethnic cleansing of my mother tongue from its Arabic and Farsi origins. It becomes completely Sanskritized. So to an extent, I would say that the uh, idea of what you say, you know, I mean, this is how I was talking about Gandhi, and what you see in the production of a language that changed us, you know, my self-concept, Edward wrote about Orientalism, but where does my self-concept come from? German Orientalism. You know, when I say I, identity, it's German Orientalism. I don't know who I am. That's what produced me. So to, and also this Bongo Darshan. Bongo Darshan, that is to say a completely Sanskritized version of my mother tongue. So from that point of view, I would say that somebody like Bunkin Chandro, even as I have read his novels with extraordinary enjoyment since the time that I was a child, even as I'm completely outraged by Pascal Casanova not mentioning this fantastic phenomenon in terms of the World Republic of Letters, as a Bengali, I'm a little, see, identity. Since I get into the protocols of the text, I am a little troubled by this itinerary in uh, Bonkim, which is noticed also very strongly by Muslim intellectuals in Bangladesh. They're try as they're trying to win back <coughs> the language, they feel very strongly that Bonkim is a magnificent, monumental figure, but with this kind of agenda, which took Bengali away from them for some time. That's, that would be my answer. Thank you. Thank you.